Good day, ladies and gents. My name is Sir Teleto, and today I'll be narrating Help Wanted by Whitley Flat. I really like this story, and I really hope you do too. Without further ado, let's get to it. We lost another receptionist. You know the one down on three? Yeah, she didn't show up for work today. Roth Marks told the human resource woman. No, don't worry about it. I'll call for a temp while I interview for a permanent replacement. Good help is hard to find these days. Ralph began clicking the necessary buttons on his computer screen that would post the online job posting for the now vacant position. This receptionist had lasted just for four months, but that was practically a record for all court industrial kitchen supplies. The turnover of the company was remarkably high and as the president of sales and staffing, it was Ralph's responsibility to hire. He looked over his calendar for the coming month, thinking he could probably squeeze a few interviews in throughout the next week. He hit the intercom to allow him to speak to his own receptionist. Mary, please hurry Friday afternoon for interviews. We lost another receptionist. Will do, Mr. Marks, Mary replied, leaning back in his chair of Ralph's side. If only all the women he hired could be like Mary, always present, on time, cheerful, and competent. She had been his secretary for as long as he held his position, and he hadn't had a problem yet. He knew he was very lucky to have her. It can be easy coming into work every day and not knowing who will be sitting out there answering your phones, typing your correspondence, bringing you coffee. First the world problems, as they say, but it really can make all the difference. Of course, it didn't hurt that Mary was attractive. Blonde curls, blue eyes, Kirby, stereotypical hot receptionist. But Ralph had always made it a point to keep things completely professional, as had Mary. His wife Lisa had never approved of Mary, had always been jealous. She constantly compared her mousy brown hair and flat-chested figure to the other woman's bouncy logs and hourglass shape. His marriage had really never been the same since he got the promotion to president that afforded him his own secretary. Though he explained it again and again that he was confident in his choice of marrying her and that there was absolutely nothing going on between him and Mary, she never quite believed him. She didn't believe when he had said that he was working late even if he called her from his office phone. She always imagined the wars. They had never been able to have kids, and while Raph was secretly happy about that fact, it left Lisa with a lot of free time. She didn't have a career or hobbies, or even many friends, so she spent nearly all of her time worrying about him. There had been a brief period where things had actually seemed to be looking up. Lisa had started volunteering at the local women's shelter, she really took an interest in the cause and had taken special liking to some of the women. She took them on lunch dates, shopping, that sort of thing. Raph wasn't thrilled with her spending so much of his hard-earned money on these women and this caused a minor tension between them. But in the end, he backed off, letting her have her fun as long as it kept her occupied. Lisa's favorite was a 20-year-old girl named Jessica. She had two young children and an abusive ex-boyfriend. She was small and mousy just like Lisa. Ralph guessed they bonded over that and, of course, Lisa was crazy about the kids. There were two boys, age two and four. Even Ralph had to admit that they were cute little things. All big eyes and curls but they were also loud and sticky and rambunctious. Definitely not his cup of tea and he didn't like having them around the house too much. He was also suspicious of their mother. He thought she might steal from them. Lisa was well aware of his feelings and did her best to keep the visits to the house to daytime hours when Ralph would be at work. For almost a full year, things were going well. Lisa was fulfilled and Ralph was just happy to be able to come and go as he pleased without her constant nagging. 
The couple had never been that passionately in love, but it seemed as if they were back in the early days of their marriage. They were actually happy to see each other after a long day apart. They even went on a few dates. Overall, things were great, until the day that Ralph came home to find his favorite watch missing. It was a very expensive item, and he was sure he had left it on the mantel. But when he returned home from work that day, it was gone. In his mind, there were really only one explanation. At first, Lisa denied that Jessica could possibly have anything to do with it. She would never do that to me, she said. Soon enough, though as days came and went with no sign of the watch, she had to concede that maybe she did take it. As far as Ralph could tell, there was a big blow when Lisa confronted Jessica about taking the watch. She had vehemently insisted that she was innocent and was so taken aback that Lisa would make such an accusation that she said she hoped to never see her again. This hurt Lisa very much, but she continued her volunteer work. She didn't seem to get attached to the women anymore though. She just did what she needed to and left her heart out of it. Eventually, Jessica called and apologized to Lisa for the things she had said. Though she still didn't admit that she took the watch, Lisa was ecstatic that the relationship would be repaired. Ralph had made it clear that they were not to return to his home, so Lisa had immediately made plans to visit the three of them at Jessica's new apartment. As Ralph was just finishing up some paperwork for a big account he had landed, his phone rang. Since it hadn't gone through the secretary's desk, he knew it had been someone with a direct number. Unfortunately, only one person used that line to call him. He let the phone ring through the voicemail. He was in a great mood from his big sale and refused to be brought down by Lisa's nonsense today. To his great annoyance, the phone thrilled again. Just seconds later, he snatched the phone up. What? Oh, Ralph, I can't believe this. I just can't, she wailed into his ear. What is it? Ralph asked, alarm rather than annoyed now. They're all dead, all of them. How could this happen? Okay, now I need you to slow down and explain what's going on. I can't possibly help you if I don't know what the problem is. Who's dead? Oh no, it's not your parents, is it? No, Ralph, not my parents. Jessica and the boys. I went to their apartment for a visit and just please get home. I can't be alone right now, she cried. Ralph sighed. He really wasn't in the mood to deal with this at all. No, okay. I'll be home just as soon as I possibly can. Just rest for now. I'll be there soon. He wrapped up what he was currently working on and called Mary to let her know that he would be leaving shortly and that she could have the rest of the day off as well. Mary was gone by the time he walked out into the outer office. He turned off the lights and locked up, resisting the urge to check things in the shower room. He headed home. Lisa was sleeping on the couch when he got home. Her face was red and puffy from crying. Ralph tried to be quiet in order not to wake her up, but her eyes snapped open as soon as he walked into the room. At first, she looked confused. Then her face crumbled in on itself as she remembered what was happening. Oh, Ralph, it was horrible, she cried. It turned out that Lisa had been the one to find the bodies. She was stopping by for a visit. After knocking several times, she tried the front door and found it unlocked. Inside, she found Jessica's body lying in a pool of blood in the kitchen. She was beaten black and blue and barely recognizable. The boys were still in the bed they shared with their mother. They could almost have been sleeping, she said, if not for the gaping wounds in each of their heads and the coagulated blood drying on the pillows. At least the boys didn't suffer, honey, Ralph said comfortably. They probably didn't even know what hit them. Lisa burst into tears again. I know who hit them, she cried. That crazy Ed's boyfriend of hers. He must have tracked them down and killed them when she wouldn't take him back. She always said that he'd be the death of her. The next few months passed with Lisa in an increasingly depressed state. She became desperately needy, and while Ralph tried to be patient and supportive, his patience quickly grew thin. 
he paid for the best psychologist around who diagnosed Lisa with severe depression and PTSD. She was on a laundry list of medications but nothing could seem to pull her out of the dark place that she was in. There was a brief period where she seemed to be coming around until she found the watch that she had accused Jessica of stealing under the couch and broke down all over again. She called Ralph at the office crying and almost incoherent. At this point, he had had enough. He was missing work left and right over her silliness. He had even lost the big client because he wasn't able to make an important business dinner. Lisa, this is getting to be unacceptable. You need to grow up and move on. Those people were not your family and were nothing but a burden on society. I know you love them but they are gone and will never come back. Your mopping and crying and calling me at work will not help them. If you want to be miserable, go right ahead, but leave me out of it. There was a silence on the phone for a long moment, and then Lisa whispered, Okay, and hung up. Ralph felt that he may have taken it a step too far, but what else could he do? He didn't see any other way to handle the situation that wouldn't have been equally hurtful. So he put the situation out of his mind and focused on his work. There were no more phone calls from Lisa that day. No more calls for the next three days, in fact. Ralph felt that he had done exactly the right thing. Lisa had been more herself lately, very quiet, but he quite enjoyed that. Ralph took advantage of that by working later and later each day. One night he came in around 10 o'clock at night and found Lisa waiting for him at the kitchen table. He was even later than usual and opened his mouth to give some sort of explanation or apology. But the look on her face stopped him. Her calm demeanor from the last two days were nowhere to be found. Her face was twisted into a sneer that he would have sworn she was incapable of. Her generally sweet and amiable attitude was what attracted him to her and the thing he still counted on from her. The way that she was looking at him now, he barely recognized her as his wife. Rob decided to ignore the strange way Lisa was behaving. Hey, sorry I'm a little late. It was a crazy day. How are you? Lisa snorted mirthlessly. Oh, I'm just great. It's always so nice to sit home alone waiting for your cheating husband to get done fucking his secretary and come home. Ralph was dumbfounded by that outburst. He shook his head and sighed, rubbing his eyes. Lisa, I thought we were past this. I know you've been having a rough time lately, but let's not overreact. What will you have me think then? She demanded. Should I believe that my husband is working late into the night selling kitchen appliances? She laughed again, but there were tears leaking from her eyes. Rav started towards her, meaning to touch her arm. Lisa, please. But she caught him off. No, I'm done looking the other way. I've been your quiet little mouse for too many years. What's brought this on? Ralph asked. I don't understand. Lisa was quiet for a moment. Then she sighed loudly and seemed to deflate. It was as if she had pumped herself up just enough for that exchange, and any more would completely exhaust her. Maybe, she begins, in a shaky voice, maybe I'm just finally letting myself say what I've always known. With that, she turned away from him and headed down the long hallway to the bedroom they shared. When she reached the doorway, she hesitated for a second before turning around. Fire her, or I want a divorce, she said. Then she turned back around and walked back into the bedroom, closing the door behind her. Ralph sat down heavily at the kitchen table. This was an unfortunate turn of events, he thought. He knew he couldn't fire Mary. She had been with him for far too long, and he knew that good help like her was hard to come by. On the other hand, he couldn't lose Lisa. He wasn't actually opposed to being a bachelor, in fact, it sounded like an exactly the lifestyle he would enjoy. But having a wife completed his trustworthy good guy image. As a salesman, half the battle is convincing the client to trust you. No one trusts an adulterer. He took care of a few things and then lay down on the couch. He knew that everything would probably work out for the best in the end. Nothing he could do now, anyhow, he told himself. 
Everything was quiet the next day when Raph awoke. There was no sign of Lisa. He ate a quick breakfast and rushed out of the door. He was running late. The excitement the night before had worn him out more than he would have expected. He stopped briefly to grab a duffel bag full of some things to store at work and was soon speeding down the highway. After he had parked his car right up in front of the spot with his name stenciled on it, he looked at the duffel in the back seat. He decided he'd deal with it later before he went home. It was nothing that couldn't wait after all. He was in especially good mood that morning as he pushed the large glass double doors and made his way into the lobby. He greeted the security guard at the desk and made his way to the elevator that would take him to his office. Good morning, Mr. Marks, Mary said. When he walked into the outer office, she was smiling her customary bright smile. Rob returned the greeting with a smile of his own and went into his office, closing the door behind him. He made a mental note to check into a race for Mary. Rob spent the morning making calls to clients, following up on new orders and attempting to persuade the new pizza place downtown that they would really benefit from the newest oven model they had just gotten in. He invited the owner to come on down and take a look at it. It had been Rob's idea to convert the musty unused basement into a showroom of sorts for the products. A show model of each of the high-end products they sold was housed down there. Most were fully functional so that potential customers could try them out before committing. Things were looking promising for a sale when he hung up. He slogged through several interviews for the open position that he knew were dead ends. After he walked the last candidate out and thanked them for their time, assuring that he would call them just as soon as something opened up, he sighed. No winners, huh? Mary asked. He smiled sheepishly. Guess not. Don't worry, you'll find the right one. You always do. Well, Raph replied as he walked into his office, they can't all be as good as you, now can they? Mary smiled at the comment and went back to the letter she was typing and Ralph went into the office and closed the door. He just couldn't understand how Lisa could really think that anything was going on between the two of them. They were always professional with each other. The rest of the day passed quickly and before he knew it, Mary was popping her head in to let him know that she was leaving for the night. Sits already, he asked. Afraid so, she replied. It seems like you practically live here, though. I bet you're not even close to leaving, are you? Ralph chuckled. I'm actually just wrapping up, but you are right. I can't help it, I just enjoy my work. I can tell. I definitely admire your work ethic. Have a good night, Mr. Marks. After Murray closed the door behind her, Ralph's smile seemed to evaporate. Her comment worried him. Had anyone else noticed his long hours? He decided that it would be a good idea to go ahead and head home. He had pulled on his coat and was locking up the office door when he remembered the bag in his car. He didn't really feel like dealing with it at the moment, but he had never been one to put things off, so he decided he better go ahead and get that taken care of. He was anxious to check on things in his showroom anyway. He nodded to the security guard as he pushed the doors open. Sir, excuse me. Will you need back in tonight? The young guard asked him. I'd like to go ahead and lock up, but I wouldn't want to inconvenience you. Oh, I just have a few things to put down in the showroom. You go right on ahead and lock up. I'll go in through the back door. He told him with a smile. He heard the lock click behind him as he made his way to his car. The day was unseasonably warm and the car belched out hot, musty air when he opened the door. Ralph grimaced at the smell but slid behind the wheel and pulled his car around the building to the rear entrance. He debated on parking in the no parking zone for only a moment before throwing the car in park, right alongside the back door and getting out. He decided that he would risk the ticket. He didn't plan to be inside long anyway, and the bag was pretty heavy. He made sure to prop the door open before wrestling the bag out of the back seat. Sweat was dripping from his brow by the time he made it down the long hallway and into the showroom. He sat the bag down for a moment in the doorway to catch his breath. The room was enormous. 
Along one wall were large industrial sized ovens and grills. Another displayed dishwashers and countertops. There were various specialty items along another wall, meat grinders and giant mixers. Ralph often felt like how he imagined Jack must have felt stepping into the giant's kitchen. Wanted was against the back wall, where the walk-in freezers were lined up neatly side by side. A large padlock hung from the latch of each of them. This was another of Ralph's ideas. They couldn't, after all, have the stupid interns playing around in these things and possibly getting locked in. It would really be a lawsuit waiting to happen. With a grunt, Ralph hefted the duffel and headed for the freezer in the very corner of the room. It was an older model than the rest, and there was a slim to no interest in viewing it. But still, Ralph kept it around while the rest of the inventory was rotated every few months or so. When he finally reached the freezer, he dropped the bag with a thud and started fishing for the key to the padlock. He finally found the key and opened the big door. He took a deep breath and lifted the duffel bag over the threshold and followed it with a scythe. The first thing he did was pull the door shut behind him, being careful to wedge a thin piece of cardboard into the opening so he wouldn't lock himself in. Then he turned on the overhead light and went to work on packing the bag. With that done, he sat down for a moment to rest. He felt a lot better having taken care of that task and was actually pretty tired all of a sudden. He leaned back against the icy wall and watched his breath make frost in the air. He always felt more at ease in here. Within several minutes, he was snorting lightly, chin touching his chest. His eyes snapped open when he heard footsteps in the showroom. He got to his feet with effort, his joints stiff from the cold, and hurried to the door. Mr. Marks, are you down here? Mary called. Thoughts bounced widely in his head. Should he remain silent and hope that she will go away? Or should he come out and hope that she wouldn't question why he was there in the first place? His mind finally settled on a solution, and he opened the door just enough so that she could see him. I'm in here, Mary. What brings you back to the office? I thought you'd gone home already. I did start to head home, but left my purse in the office, along with my keys, so that I couldn't get back in. When I realized what happened, I had feelings you might still be here though. Thank goodness. Mary laughed at herself a little. You must think I'm such a blondie. No, of course not, Rob said with a smile. We all make mistakes sometimes. I'll be glad to let you into the office. But hey, would you mind giving me a hand over here for just a minute? Mary hesitated for the slightest moment and then walked towards the freezer door. So, what's going on? Something wrong with the unit? Ralph didn't say anything until Mary was within arm's reach. He stepped back then opened the door wider. Mary's smile faded and was replaced by a blank, confused stare when she was in the freezer held. She tried to back away instinctively, but Ralph grabbed her arm while simultaneously clamping a hand over her mouth and pulling her into the freezer with him. He held her against his body and said quietly, can you promise me not to scream? If you can promise me that, I can let you go. We can sit down and have a talk. She quickly nodded her head and tried to say something under his hand. He removed his hand from her mouth but kept it up, ready to replace it at any moment's notice. She remained quiet though she was breathing heavily and making whimpering sounds. She looked around in horror at Ralph's prize collection. Eight women were placed around the interior of the freezer. Seven of them were seated along the walls. They were all made to look like they had just sat down for a rest after a long day of work, still dressed in business suits and dresses that they had last worn. They were all blonde and bore a disturbing resemblance to Mary herself. The thick layer of ice on all but one of the women ruined whatever illusion Ralph had been trying for. The last woman was a brunette. She was dressed in a sweatsuit and sat away from the rest of the women. Finally, Mary whispered, Why, Ralph? Why would you do this? You don't like my collection? He asked. He sounded truly surprised. Do you recognize any of them? Mary looked closer at the women and gasped, recognizing several past co-workers. How, Ralph? How could he possibly do this? 
Ah, I'm glad you asked, Rabbit exclaimed. He had been terrified of anyone finding out his little secret, but now that it had happened, he found himself excited to show them off. He held out his hand and pointed to a woman in the corner. She had clearly been there the longest. The thick layer of ice obscured her face. Courtney here was my first. She was working late and I happened to bump into her heading out the door. She didn't want to accept a ride from me, but it was raining so she did. I didn't really plan to kill her when I offered to take her home. But it was almost like someone took over my body. Once it was done, I knew I couldn't just throw her away, so I brought her here. Then I realized that I could keep her and see her anytime I liked. It wasn't long before I thought that she needed a little company. At this point, he eased away from Mary, engrossing in his own story. He was moving closer to the bodies and further from the door. Mary's eyes darted from him to the door quickly. So, you killed eight women just so that you could keep them here to look at? You know that makes you a serial killer, right? No, 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 Mary, he exclaimed. I killed seven of them to look at. The last one was unfortunately necessary. With that, he chuckled. You know, my wife actually thought that we were having an affair. She actually gave me an ultimatum last night. Fire you or get a divorce. I didn't like either of those options, so I made my own choice. You killed your wife? Mary questioned. She was determined to keep him talking until she was able to get to the door. How could you do that? Didn't you love her? Of course I loved her. She was my wife. But what option did she leave me? He frowned and turned to stare at Mary. Everything was fine before that girl and her little brats came into my life. If only they had stayed away, I wouldn't have to kill them and she wouldn't have gone crazy. How was I supposed to know the watch had fallen into the chair in my study? Mary is confused by this latest outburst, but she nods. Of course, you did what you had to. Ralph nodded and continued speaking, droning on about each of the women in his collection. Mary knew this was her last chance to make it out of the situation alive. She took a deep breath and made a break for the door. She pushed it open and got one foot out before Ralph grabbed her and pulled her back inside. She screamed for help but the door was already shut and there was no one close enough to hear her anyways. I thought you were going to be quiet, Ralph asked. Why would you do that? He seemed genuinely upset. I thought I could trust you. Do you know how hard it is to find a good receptionist? Mary was crying profusely. I wouldn't say anything. I swear, no one will ever know about this. Ralph thought for a moment. Mary could almost see the gears turning in his head. You also said you wouldn't scream, he said, and started towards her. The next morning, Rob got to the office later than usual. The outer office was dark and empty. No one had put on the coffee and the phone was ringing ceaselessly. He sighed and unlocked the door to his office. He sat down at his desk and picked up the phone. Yes, this is Ralph Marks. I'm going to need a temporary secretary. Yes, as soon as possible, please. My secretary hasn't shown up for work today. Good help is hard to find these days.